This video is brought to you by Sporlin, quality, integrity, and tradition. Got a complaint of a Dell Field um, 246 drawer cooler not working on the bottom. I suspect the top's a problem too. And my first step, um, I didn't put gauges on it or anything. Uh, I'm noticing that there's some frost coming back to the compressor, so I wanted to open it up and look in here. And look at this. Dinner. Look at that. Yum. That looks all nice and warm and toasty. That makes like a good gravy, huh? But uh, check that out. Look at how one coil's iced up and one coil's not. That's interesting. I bet you it's going to be a TXV problem with that coil would be my guess. But let's dig through this a little bit more. Got my little pump spray right here with just some hot water. We're going to get this guy uh, defrosted and then we'll finish evaluating everything. But I have a feeling this one's going to have a bad power head. The temperature controllers on this side, it senses this coil temperature, but it turns a solenoid valve in this one on and in this one on so majority of the time it's a failed power head and this coil's trying to do the entire load trying to cool the entire six drawer unit and it usually can't keep up so it freezes up so but we'll keep going through it when i'm defrosting this i'm not really concerned about the bottom of the coil i'm just putting my little wand on the top and letting the water drip down it seems counterproductive but it's actually more productive you know uh you, at least for me, I tend to want to like, oh, let's get the big chunks of ice because you get the most satisfaction out of it. But if you really just defrost from the top, you're defrosting the entire center mass of the coil. And eventually, once the coil is defrosted completely, that water will start defrosting all the ice on the bottom. So get in these corner rails in here too. Very important to make sure you get those completely defrosted. I have a feeling, I turn power back on. I have a feeling that our problem is the TXV, okay? So let's turn the temperature controller. That solenoid is opening and closing. I can hear both solenoids opening and closing. So that's a pretty good indication that the solenoid's probably working. There's always a possibility, but it's very rare that a solenoid's plugged up on the stuff that I work on. So next we need to test the TXV to see if it's the power head. Once we get in here, the test for this, once you do this, you have to change the TXV, okay? But this is gonna tell me if something's stuck in the TXV or if the power head is the problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the sensing bulb that has a gas charge in it. If I get little to no gas coming out of it, then it's just the power head. And if there's a lot of gas coming out, more than likely there's something wrong with the TXV. Almost nothing, almost absolutely nothing, meaning that the power head is bad. So we can go ahead and replace just the power head. Now, this customer is replacing both this entire unit in the next four months. So they just want me to do what I have to do. Even though the coils look like junk, they just want it fixed. So I'm gonna change a power head on it today. All right, got this other side opened up so I can access the TXV and the sensing bolt better. We're gonna go ahead and recover the gas now. So we're hooked up. We have uh, need to purge right here, okay? All right, we're good, we're good, we're good. And we're gonna hit start. And we'll go ahead and recover the charge out of this guy. Then we'll unscrew the power head, change the liquid line filter dryer, and then hope that that fixes our problem. Now, this system has TXVs, and it does have a receiver, but there is no king valve on the receiver to pump the system down. So that's why I'm having to actually recover the charge out of this guy. Um, if it, in a perfect world, we would have a receiver king valve, we could just literally pump down the refrigerant charge and go from there, but not in this case. These reach-ins, they're probably rather small, so they usually don't put valves on the receivers if they have them. The sensing bulb literally just came off. It was only being held on by that tape. Junk. Um, I very carefully tweaked the valve down to access the power head a little bit better. Again, you gotta be careful because these coils are really fragile. Um, and we're done, we're recovered right now. So we're gonna go ahead and hit stop, purge, purge out the remaining refrigerant in the high side hose and everything they can out of the tank or the machine. And then uh, we're good to go. Go ahead and hit stop, turn it off, and I'm gonna go get all the stuff I need to change out the power head and the dryer.
right, we got power head installed, sensing bulb wrapped with insulation tape. We got the new dryer installed, so now it's time to uh, pull the evacuation and start putting the coils back together. Just got done putting all the coils back together. Got my scale, we're getting ready to charge it. I just turned off the vacuum pump. We're currently in decay and I'm satisfied with that number. So we pulled down to 500, it slowly rose up to 921 and we're good to go. Now it's not ideal that I'm using gauges, but this is a really small system. If I try to use my giant hoses and take out the cores and stuff, you're likely to break something from the weight of all the hoses and all that. So. We're gonna weigh the charge in. This guy takes 32 ounces of 404, so. I uh, turned off the system so that way the compressor doesn't start up. And we're just about done. We're at 31 ounces. We're gonna go ahead and close this down. I was just weighing in through the high side and letting it come back up through the low side. And we're right at 32 ounces. So we can uh, safely make sure these are closed and we can turn this on and turn this on watch the unit start up and then I have a thermometer here we should see a drop in temperature so at the moment it's reading 70 degrees so let's give it a few minutes if the coils working that'll drop significantly the system is slowly uh, stabilizing out again I have the coils open so it's gonna be under a load right now but uh, feels like it's cool already let's give it a look we're at 59 degrees so we're clearly working on this coil now 56 degrees 55 degrees so yeah we're good both coils are working now I need to put the drawers back together and watch it come down to temp and make sure it shuts off at the right temperature all right we are pumping down right now and the condensing unit just shut off and the box is at 31 so that's a little cold so we're gonna turn it a little bit warmer but we'll see what it turns on at but I'm satisfied we're gonna give them the keys and uh, that's it for now hopefully this will last until they get the whole unit replaced Okay, it's very important that you understand what you're working on. In this situation, I was very familiar with the operation of this reach and cooler. If you're not familiar with the way that it operates, download the installation and operation manual and it'll give you a basic understanding. So this was just a basic pump down system, but it had two evaporator coils, one temperature controller. The temperature controller was in the right side evaporator coil. Each coil had a solenoid valve and a thermostatic expansion valve. In the situation of this video, the evaporator coil on the right hand side had a failed power head for the expansion valve. Now, I could have changed the entire expansion valve. It would have probably been a little bit more difficult and I would have had to have ordered the valve unless I went in with an aftermarket valve. But for these manufacturers, even though the operation of the valve is the same, there actually is a difference from an OEM valve to an aftermarket valve. The one that you can go buy at your supply house, the, the ends, the connections are shorter, and oftentimes the valve is a tiny bit taller as far as the total height of the valve. So I prefer to stay OEM, especially on these tiny little reaching coolers whenever possible. But in this situation, because they had a Sporlin expansion valve, I didn't have to change the entire valve. What had failed was the power head. And that's why I did that test where once I was sure that everything was working, the solenoid valves as best as possible, I clipped the tip on the power head for the expansion valve. And when I cut it, if it's a good power head, you will see a gas charge released. It'll go spray out a little mixture of gas, okay? that would indicate to me that more than likely there was an actual problem with the internals of the valve. Now, even furthermore, if you wanted to get really crazy, you could actually just rebuild the existing valve. If you had an OEM one with the same internals, you could just take those out and put it into the new valve if you needed to. That's assuming that the strainer, because oftentimes the expansion valves will have an inline strainer on these OEM valves that's brazed into it, uh, wasn't plugged up, okay? But anyways, going off on a tangent as usual. I was able to get in there and change just the power head. So I recovered the refrigerant out of the system um, and I was able to go ahead and unscrew the power head, screw a new one on, insulate the sensing bulb, properly secure it, put it all back together, change the liquid line filter dryer, pull an evacuation, weigh in the refrigerant charge and start the system back up. Once I started it up, I watched the unit come down to temperature and all was well. Couldn't really find anything else wrong with it. But I will say, you guys saw how disgusting the inside of that box was, okay? I leave that up to the customer. 
a good majority of the time they want, you know, like they don't even know how dirty it is till I get working on there. But actually one of my frustrations is when I show it to them and then the customer's like, oh, well, you have the box apart. Can we clean it? But here's the issue with that. I, I would love to let them clean the box, but I'm in a time crunch and they want me out of their kitchen, right? So typically you need to be out of these kitchens by about 10 a.m., 10.30 a.m. at the latest. They typically open at 11 a.m. and they need to be able to prep, put all the food into the reach in and all this stuff. So if I was to stop what I was doing when I first started working on this and let them clean the box for an hour, that would set me back an hour. So oftentimes when they ask me, hey, you have it apart, can we clean it? I say no. You guys need to do that on another day because I'm on a time crunch. And unless you guys want me in your cook's line well into your lunch, you know, then you guys need to just clean this at another time. Let me finish what I'm doing. Okay. There's times when I'll take it apart and go scrub the parts myself. But in this situation, I really didn't have time to do that. So I made the customer aware that, hey, you guys do need to clean this. You know, this is gross. It needs to be taken care of. But I'm not going to, I wasn't going to spend any more time on it to that day because I didn't have the time, you know, and I had to get them up and running. Okay. So I do like to clean their equipment when I can. I like to make it all nice and shiny, but then also I'm under a time crunch. And in this situation just had to get it operational. Okay. So I left that to them, told them to give it a, a good, you know, deep clean, basically turn the box off one night, deep clean the heck out of it, told them not to spray it down. You know, who knows what happens with that. One thing I will say is, is shame on the manufacturers of these units because they make them dang near impossible for the customer to really get in there and clean it. I mean, I get it. It's the easiest to clean it when I have the whole box apart because you got to take all the drawer boxes apart, the drawers out, there's a bunch of screws and everything. But you know, these manufacturers, when they're making this equipment, I get it that they're under a, a crunch from the customer and the customer wants it cheaper, faster, better kind of thing. But, you know, this is all on the manufacturer because they're the ones that designed it and made it dang near impossible for the customer to take this box apart. It is what it is. Thank you so very much for making it to the end of the video. It is really awesome. I do have to say I just got back from the AHR trade show and uh, it was very humbling to meet a good, good amount of you guys that are watching right now. A lot of people walked up, got to take pictures, shake their hand, have conversations. And I apologize to the people that, you know, had to wait a little while to talk to me because I try to give everybody the amount of time that they want. So I tried to spend as much time with each person that wanted to come up and have a conversation with me. And I tried to, you know, spend as much time as I could. So hopefully y'all understand. Okay. If you guys haven't already, I'd really, really appreciate it. If you guys would consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, please consider sharing these videos with your friends and anybody else that you think would get a benefit from them, please help this channel to grow. Okay. There is kind of a grassroots thing when it comes to this channel and it does really help when you all share this content and help to promote it. It seems that a lot of the social media platforms, YouTube, but all the other ones too, are having a hard time with the way that they used to promote things and they just don't promote it the same way. So it is what it is. I'm not begging you guys. I just appreciate it if you could share it, okay? Thank you so very much. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel, the simplest way to support this channel is just watch the videos, okay? That's the easiest way. Uh, there's also a couple other methods, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. Those are all different ways that you guys can make monthly commitments to the channel. There's links in the show notes of this video on how to do that. Um, also, if you guys are interested in purchasing any tools, uh, check out truetechtools.com. I have an affiliate link set up with them. Uh, on majority of the items on their website, my affiliate code will get you an 8% discount, and then I get a small commission from that. And my affiliate code is really easy. It's simply big picture, one word, and that's it. Just put big picture on checkout in the, uh, the affiliate link box when you're at the checkout right there and you'll get your discount if it applies to the stuff that you purchased, okay? Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you and uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?